we would like to introduce our first guest of this eighth annual sync up, which is Mr. Philip Mann from Louisiana Entertainment. Thank you. And so Philip is a dear friend and somebody I've known for a long time, and he administers the tax incentive program for sound recording and also for live music. And uh, do you, hand you don't handle film as well, do you? Oh, God, no. Okay, right. Yeah, so, so <laughs> since you bring it up, so as you all know, uh, Louisiana is well known now as a, as a hub of film uh, production and, and uh, production, shooting, shooting movies, TV shows, commercials, and so on. Um, and has been since, what, about 2003? Is that when the program, the film program first started? 2002, 2003, some of, yeah. Right, because we're... 2002, 2003 ish. Um, and so, and the film program has been so successful that Louisiana, am I correct with this, is now the number one location in the country for film production? Ahead of California? Arguably. Yeah. So it's an amazing, so it's a huge multi multi million dollar program. The state gives a, a, an extraordinary package of incentives to film it, production. It's a billion dollar industry, billion with a B. And but it, and started as what when the program first started? Tiny, yeah, tiny. Yeah. It less than you know, you a few know, million bucks, a few million. So yeah, to go from a few million to a a clean billion, <laughs> not bad for Louisiana. Go team. Of course, thirty thousand jobs a year. Now, what we know, though, of course, is that the state of Louisiana currently has a $1.6 billion budget deficit. 1.8 now, apparently. I stand corrected. It, it, stand it goes corrected. up $100 million or so every day. Great. And that's all because of the film program. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, there are those who argue that the film programs yeah. are bleeding the state dry. They don't necessarily right. recognize the, the jobs that it creates. And there's arguments back and forth about who's actually creating jobs or, or what it's is very creating. much a regional argument um, from folks in other parts of the state where there's not significant right. amount of film production. But the, I mean, so we we can we all agree, of course, that the film industry is responsible for creating tons absolutely. and tons of jobs, and is something that's absolutely in, it, it, essential. And and I actually am of the opinion that one of the reasons why New Orleans, is in, in particular, has become such a boom town in the past few years is largely because of the influx of film production. It's huge. Which is bringing all of these people into New Orleans who have never been here before, and right. there's so many young people in the industry that are that they come here, they work on a show, and they move here. I mean, it just, I mean, it, we it, all know dozens of people that, that, that for whom that's the case. It has been a big piece of the post-Katrina transformation of this, of this city and also the economy, for sure. But now we're in a legislative fiscal session, yeah. and there yes. are those that really, I think it's the, the conventional wisdom now is that the, 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 the film program in particular is, is soon to, at the very least, take a, a brisk haircut. Um, uh, it depends on how you define haircut. What, what, what I would say is that um, there's probably, and again, you know, I, I'm not the film guy, but I would suspect that at some point during this legislative session there's going to be a cap that's put on the program. Um, in the past there has not been a cap at all, so the legislature has no ability to, um, and the fiscal folks over uh, up in Baton Rouge don't have the ability to predict how much the film program is going to cost the state of Louisiana. So especially in the fiscal situation that we're in right now, it's imperative um, to these folks, and I, frankly I don't disagree, that we need to at least have some sort of predictability so that we don't find ourselves in a position where, you know, for example, this week LSU has had to start paperwork for, you know, exigency, p potential bankruptcy, those kinds of things, and um, I, don't think that that's the direction the state needs to go um, from an education perspective. So we need to find a way to um, to uh, accomplish both of these things, right? So, so how much is being? And, and I know you're not the, the film guy, but you got to know. Is roughly. this what we're going to talk about no, all day? No, we're going <laughs> to move on very quickly. But uh, but just to, to to finish the point, how much is the state spending currently? Uh, per year on the film program now? Uh, I, I think uh, on average, uh, I think this current year, well, it depends on whether you're asking fiscal year or calendar year. Um, if I'm not mistaken, calendar year, and don't quote me on it, for 14 was somewhere in the like 200 to 212 million a year. 
Um, I think there has been a bigger year uh, than that, but um, anywhere between 200 to 250 million dollars a year. So it's a lot of money. So the state's giving 200, 250 million dollars worth of incentives to the film industry each year. Correct. And so there are some in the legislature that really just want to. They, they at the very. I guess there are some who just want to eliminate it. And when they, if they were to do that, then of course the film industry would probably all just disappear. It's extremely short-sighted, I think, for people to say that we can't figure out how to control this, so we're going to eliminate it. I, I, that's not going to happen. I mean, y you know, luckily you have some legislators, uh, specifically here in New Orleans, uh, Senator J.P. Morrell has has been has doing a wonderful job um, trying to uh, assist the film industry and the folks that have a vested interest in it. It's try to control it, rein it in somewhat, try to pass some legislation that may um, that will rein in some of the potential abuses that you all see in the press all the time. Have there been the abuses time. in the film program? Uh, apparently a few. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's, well, they, that's, that's shocking. They just hit double digits for prosecutions. So. <laughs> so, yes, as we were, we were joking about that, there is actually very currently there's a trial going on. We're there not going to get into the details, but yes, so there have been, there's been... Closing arguments today, you can run over to the federal courthouse when we're done here if you want yeah, to see so, them. So so. Somebody <laughs> is, is on the hot seat right now for abusing the film program, and you know, that's not cool. No, it's uh, not. So, um, speaking of the music program, yes. the sound recording tax incentive program, how many prosecutions have there been in that program? Zero. Okay. I run that program. Party on, Wayne. Okay. <laughs> the other program I run, live performance, zero. Awesome. I run that program. All right. So, um, the so the state, in addition to having a an incentive for the creation of, of motion pictures, also has one for creating sound recordings, which is really what I wanted to talk to, sync up music, uh, about, and that's really what we're here for. But we should also touch on live performance as well, because that's being used yep. um, by the, the 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 touring yes. industry. Big in, time. In, in fact, maybe we should talk about that first, and then get into the meat of sound recording. Sounds good. Yeah. So, because I know people really want to talk about sound recording, we should just make them wait for <laughs> a while longer. So they can't. So they have to sit there, right? <laughs> So, um, so live recording. So, uh, so just briefly, how how does it work with the li the live recording incentive? Who's it for, and how does it work? Live performance incentive. Live, yeah, live, live performance. Well, sorry. The first thing I wanted to say bef before I jump into that is that it's so incredible to see this building and what the the Jazz and Heritage Foundation has accomplished with this. And um, uh, one of the things that um, that we suffer from as a government employees sitting in Baton Rouge, sitting in our offices, is that we rarely have the opportunity to see, I guess, the fruits not of our labor, but the fruits of the taxpayers' labor. Um, and when, when I see something like this, even though you didn't have to use tax incentives to do it, it really reminds me um, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, to be very honest with you, going through the stuff we're going through right now, like during legislative session and fiscal session, it just sucks. It really sucks. And um, there's not a lot of people um, that uh, have the same sort of appreciation that we do for what we're accomplishing and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, when I first got this gig, and in fact the reason my program existed, um, after, after Katrina, um, uh, Kathleen Blanco uh, signed legislation for the live performance program, and the primary uh, thrust of it initially was to try to get um, the theaters on Canal Street reopened. Um, so one thing I would say is that uh, in the seven, almost eight years I've done this, the state, uh, uh, the live performance infrastructure program um, is responsible for over $250 million worth of public and private investment in live performance infrastructure. I used to come to New Orleans all the time uh, for these projects. I don't get here as often as I ought to, but I'll just give you a quick rundown of the things that the state has accomplished and that you guys have accomplished as taxpayers. The Sanger Theater, the Joy Theater, the Civic Theater, the Stage Door Canteen at the World War II Museum, the new home of the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, um, the Ashe Cultural Arts Center. Uh, it, it's just outstanding what we've been able to accomplish and um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when I come to New Orleans, it reminds me why I'm doing what I'm doing um, because oftentimes we, we tend to forget. So I hope you guys enjoy the, your new beautiful theaters here because it's just an amazing thing. Um, uh, but 
That said, the live performance infrastructure program has sunset. Now we are focusing more on the live performance production incentive. The, 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 the thrust of this program is to incentivize major touring uh, to start in Louisiana and to try to mirror some of the success of the film program to build an infrastructure for the live, uh, record, uh, the live performance concert industry. Um, to be honest with you, most of the success that we have had with this program has been located up in Bossier City, Louisiana, actually. Um, we have uh, started three major touring productions by Cirque du Soleil. We started the Michael Jackson Immortal Tour, which is the largest touring production in the history of North America. We started uh, George Strait's tour up there, Eric Church, Jason Aldean, lots of country artists. And I would say the biggest, um, the biggest, uh, I was gonna say thorn in my crown, but jewel in my crown. <laughs> is we are about to launch um, Taylor Swift's North American World Tour in Bossier City, Louisiana, uh, using the live performance production incentive. So now is, is her first show of the tour the one that's going to be in Baton Rouge the, the, on Memorial Day weekend? No. So she is actually going to do the first show well, in I only Bo know about that because I have kids. Right. Uh, oh, no. I know that you're a huge <laughs> fan, Scott. Don't lie. Um, in Bossier City, she's going to do her first show. She's going to rehearse up there at the CenturyLink Center. Um, like I said to you earlier, one of the reasons we've had so much success up there is, to be frank, there's not a heck of a lot going on in the building up there. So these uh, major promoters, producers like Cirque du Soleil, AEG, Live Nation, etc., can get the availability in the buildings that they can't get at the Superdome and at the arena here. Um, but she's going to do her first show there. And then she's going to come um, and play a sold-out show at uh, Tiger Stadium. Um, so I won't be able to wear my Alabama hat at, at Tiger Stadium, which is frustrating. But. So th the, the, the concert promoters that take big acts and go on big tours, yes. they're finding out that in Louisiana they can come and stage their tour, prep their tour, launch the tour. They can go to a fairly isolated place like a Bossier City. Yep. Ev they can rent out the Enorma Dome for yep. two months, and nobody's going to miss it. Enorma Dome, that's from Spinal Tap. You noticed. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that's why I like you, Wasn't it? Thank you. <laughs> We're playing, you know, the Enormo Dome, whatever. And they can walk around town, and, like, people don't even... Yeah, Bossier, Bossier City, a town? Uh, not a lot of, you know... I, I can imagine what, the, what it was like when all of the Chinese and Russian acrobats from Cirque du Soleil were staying in the casinos. I, that would have been quite a sight. <laughs> I'm sure they got along just fine. Awesome. Um, okay, so great. So that's the live performance uh, program in a nutshell. Yes. D just very quickly, d for local Louisiana musicians, mm -hmm. is there much by way of the live performance incentive that would apply to, you know, our average yes, uh, that's a great folks question. that you would so see I at a, at a, you know, a lot Festival International or a Jazz Festival? Yes, so like one of my frustrations early on is that we were saddled with, um, and I hate to use that term in a pejorative sense, but the language in the statute, because I administer a law um, I will delicately say that the folks that drafted these laws don't necessarily have a strong understanding of what they're writing. Um, so one of the struggles that I have had is to find a way to work. I, I, I'm at my core kind of a not-for-profit guy. That's, that's how I came up in the not-for-profit theatrical world. And it was frustrating to me that we had all of this ability to incentivize these major out-of-state out of um, well, I don't want to call AEG out of state because they have a huge presence here, but Live Nation, who just opened a permanent office here, um, they could take advantage of the program, but it was difficult for local not-for-profits and local artists to take advantage of the program. So we have, um, I would say, found ways to work with local performing arts organizations, especially in New Orleans, and I'm very, very happy to say that now the New Orleans Opera Association is taking advantage of the program. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is the LPO, the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, is going to be able to take advantage of the incentives for their inaugural season at, when they come back to the Orpheum. So the Orpheum is a really cool example of what the program can do because the Orpheum has used the in infrastructure credits to, re, uh, to rebuild the facility, to renovate the facility, and the orchestra will be using the production incentive. 
And that's the same with the Civic Theater. The Civic Theater um, used the infrastructure and they also use the production incentive as well. So um, w what I will say as far as the individual artist, again, this is a frustration. Jefferson Performing Arts Center, did they uh, use it? They, they did not, but they managed to find 52 something million dollars to build that new building, which is not a actually a functional building. But um, the, uh, uh, no, they have not used it. But again, one of the, one of the things that, that is a, a struggle is to find ways for individual artists, uh, uh, and that was the, Genesis of your question. Uh, yeah, like if you're yeah. lost by you ramblers. Yeah. yeah. Is there um, anything in that program for you? No, but the sound recording program? Yes, so good segue. Moving right yeah. along. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I actually have your website here. Um, so, sound recording. Mm -hmm. So, people, anybody in the audience, or people who are recording artists who make records? Or labels or management, that kind of thing? Cool. All right. So this is Excellent. your show. Yeah. So so th so this is so so uh, ha what is this program and how does it work? So the sound recording incentive program that the state of Louisiana has on the books right now is a direct rebate program, and I, I don't want to get too technical, but you hear about tax credits, you hear about selling tax credits, transferring them, monetizing them, much in the way the film industry does. But the very cool thing about the sound recording program that I want to impart from the beginning is this is a direct rebate program, meaning if you qualify for the program and we can get into that and you follow all of the guidelines, the state will simply cut you a check for 25% of what you spend that is a qualifying expenditure. That is one of the things that we have struggled with and a, a lot of that is our responsibility on the messaging of it is to impart that to individuals, labels, bands, artists, that it is a direct rebate program, it's cash back to you. Um, one of the biggest things that, that we, has changed in the program and it's something that we listen to loud and clear and I think a lot of this started at Sync Up as that at one time... What? Wait, say that again? Yeah. <laughs> a, a, a lot. Actually, no, I'll say that honestly, that Sync Up has been responsible across the board in many programs, but specifically in the music industry program, for influencing substantial positive changes to the legislation. There's your sound bite. So. <laughs> Somebody write that down. How's that? Wait, how? Okay. So one of the problems with the program that, that we saw is that the minimum expenditure to qualify was 15 grand. Now, to folks in perhaps in the legislature, that doesn't seem like a lot of money when you're looking at movies that cost tens of millions of dollars, but I know um, as a former and current musician myself, I'm a drummer, kind of, uh, that that's a lot of money to cut a record unless you're, you know, R.E.M., Dave Matthews, these kinds of folks who have used the program, especially local New Orleans, Louisiana recording artists, that is just far too much. But if um, I remember correctly, back in, in those days, it was $15,000. Yes. So you had to spend a minimum of $15,000 in production in the studio making a record. Correct. In a year. Correct. But, but you c <laughs> Yes, but what? But as a result of uh, some of the uh, things that we heard but no, but at, at your the wonderful time, But it was $15,000, but you could, if you were a record label, yes. you might not spend $15,000 on any one record, but right. you might make five records for, for $3,000 and you could qualify that way. That was called bundling and that went away. And the reason that went away is because we, and I say the legislature, changed the law. And now for Louisiana residents, the minimum spending threshold is now $5,000. Much more attainable for, for your average person making a record. I certainly hope so. Is there anyone in the room that has used the program at the $5,000 threshold, just out of curiosity? I actually had a conversation. Yes. To get it, oh, you mean the audit, the cost report. Yeah, that's it. Well, do we want to start questions, or do we do? Let me uh, just wait, briefly yeah, no, finish. A couple of quick things, and then we'll yeah, have, no, we'll have absolutely. Some that's a, that's why I'm here because I. In I case you couldn't hear, hear she was saying that the uh, that if a thousand dollar audit fee to participate in the program on a five thousand dollar record that's a big hurdle. It is substantial, and you know one of the the things that's a struggle for us is that we are not really in the position as state employees to dictate to the CPA industry what they can and cannot charge. What I would say, though, if you were uh, an artist and you had met the minimum threshold 
and a CPA tells you that it's going to cost you $1,000 to get a cost report or an audit, I would sell, tell them that that's ridiculous. Um, y you have to tell them that. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't do that, but I think that that's absurd. Um, it's not necessary. Um, and if, if a CPA tells you that, that that's what it's going to cost and that you can't find somebody else to do it, call me or email me and I'll see if I can help you find some other folks to do it. I'm going to have cards and, but yeah, I mean, to have 20% of your budget be an audit, I mean, screw that. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So that answers that question. Wait, do you read, do you want to say it? Right, come use the mic. So we are starting questions. I guess well, we no, are. I was just going to make a comment. Yeah. Isn't it true that if you don't spend 50000 that you don't need a full audit and you could just get a cost report? Uh, that's right. Uh, so, um, it, 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 which wait. is the perfect question. So, so that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you, Reed. Um, under 15, uh, under 50, is it under 50? It's just a cost report. Um, the cost report guidelines, I, I'm not going to say that they're minimal because it's very important that we are very stringent about this stuff because as I said when we started, one of the things that I pride myself on is keeping these programs clean. Um, but yeah, that's a very, very good point. Now, an audit, a full audit, it is justified that a thousand bucks, if not more, for that. Mix. Okay, a thousand dollars for a cost too much. <laughs> okay, that's okay. That's yeah, yeah that's yeah, great. Thank you, Reed. I mean, but I mean, shouldn't so that ought to be able? To, if a, a, I don't, I'm not sure I know what a cost report is, but that sounds to me like something I ought to be able to generate myself with an Excel spreadsheet. A CPA has to do yeah. it, though. Oh, oh, they do. Yeah, okay. yeah the that's C the law requires it. Yeah. Yeah, the CPA has to do it, and it, I mean, I am only a little ways into this, so I'm not sure that I'm properly informed. But in this particular case, it was expensive because it actually takes the CPA a long time to file all this stuff online and they have to, it's pretty cumbersome on their end. That's why they charge that money. Uh, I would disagree that it's a cumbersome process. Cool. Well, so I, it, yeah, yeah. I'm looking for some names. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm here to help you with the, pr if it's cumbersome, then it's our fault for making right. it too cumbersome. Fair enough. But I think the, one of the points that, I, that I'd like us to address a little bit is, so the sound recording incentive program, unlike the film program, mm -hmm. has a cap on it. It so, does, so yeah. It's, so there's a, there's a maximum amount that the state is allocated, has said it will spend in giving rebates through the sound recording program. How much is that per year? Three million a year. And of I've that- I've never, ever even approached that What's number. the most you've given in sound recording The most in we've given year? was when we still have, and Reed probably knows as well as I do, is when we still had the infrastructure program, and we still didn't hit the three million. Did so, you get over two million? Uh, uh, no, not to my. I, I think we've gotten close to two million when we still had infrastructure credits. Do you remember how much it was last year? Oh, gosh. Because infra infrastructure, for those of you who don't know, is D it, it, you could get, you could also build a studio and claim those expenses, D and so the state didn't would give I send you, you those fancy on. spreadsheets with those numbers on it. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. No, I think to be honest with you, I think for 2014, uh, honestly, it was under a million dollars. Uh, All right, so for those of you who are watching online, so th you, th we're going to put everybody's business out there right now. This is all public record. This so. public record. So yeah. sound recording production names, so Honey Island Swamp Band yeah. for a TBD album. They spent $32,425 on their record, yep. and they created an estimated 20 jobs, and sorry guys we're putting your stuff out there right now and so they qualified for they got a tax credit back of seven seventy one hundred dollars yeah and that was just a check that was sent back to the band you know or or to the llc whatever the, the entity was that applied for it glenn just david cash. andrews sixteen thousand yeah. dollars payroll of seventy four hundred dollars yeah tax credit of is am i reading looking at the right one thirty four hundred dollars yeah kimball's here is that what you got He's saying that they're running into problems getting certified in the cost of the CPA. This is the manager of Glenn David Andrews, Kimball Packard, everybody. Yeah, I, you need to talk to me about that. Where I'm going to help you. That's why you're here, bro. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> no, so, okay. So, but, all right. So, getting, when you say get trouble right, getting right. certified, can, can you use is the it, mic and, and yeah, please, tell us please, what, please. what you mean about that? Yeah, it's just the, it's the cost, the, the CPAs, and we haven't been able to find one who 
wants to pay or you know wants to charge a reasonable fee for it. What are they trying to charge? Two thousand dollars. It seems to be the average, and you know that's to to do, go through all this work and end up with only fifteen hundred doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I do not disagree with you. Yeah. On a tax credit of thirty four hundred dollars. Yeah. I mean, you know, How, on a sixteen thousand dollar project, thirty four hundred is a, is a lot uh, is a decent budget, chunk of money. Uh, yeah, I mean, we spent a total of about eighteen thousand, but a couple yeah, and that's just a cost certified. report. It's not an yeah. audit. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. so you, you, what we need to do is, um, uh, um, I don't know if we've corresponded via email. You may have corresponded with Lacey yeah. that works with me. Yes, I did. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I have to be made aware of these things because okay. I can, I can help you and if it in, and if it involves twisting arms then I'm happy to do it because that's ridiculous. All right, thank you. Yeah. So here's Davis Rogan who lives right on the corner right here. Uh Where's Davis? $12,875 oh. on his record. $4,000 worth of jobs created, tax credit of $3,200. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to tell you for a guy that lives right on the street over here, $3,200 is a big box. Yeah. So no, I get it. I get it. You know, one of the things that I would say is that you see this and it's public record and hopefully you will all have my business card and my email when I leave here. One of the things that, that I would suggest, because I don't know because I can't, I don't track everything every day, but look at some of these projects that have had similar budgets to the ones that you have and ask me who did the cost report because it's public record and I can tell you. And you can contact them directly. And it looks like and on I can this tell page you how that we're looking at, the, the smallest budget of a record... Some ones fifty three thousand, thirty one thousand, forty nine thousand, thirty two twelve, that twenty five, eight thousand dollars. That looks like the least expensive record. Who's that? Ray Boudreau. You know, know one is. of the things that's really, really interesting that I've noticed that we're really, really happy about is that we're starting to get a lot of. Um, I mean, indie bands love to record in Louisiana, especially in New Orleans. We did um, one of the Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zero records, and they ended up buying a studio here. Yeah, uh, but. If you see Beach House, we're starting to get, um, and Rose Windows, they're on Sub Pop. We're starting starting to get a lot of um, indie bands use the program, too, which is and these aren't, Are these local bands? Uh, no, no, but they're coming here to do their records. And one of the other things that we're really excited about is at the very, very bottom there, um, that project, Action Acadien, uh, I'm not a French speaker, Je une chanson du mon coeur, something. That's Zachary Richard. Um, oh, nice. And we are so excited that he's using the program. It's amazing. We go up to Montreal sometimes for work. And, I mean, this guy may as well be, you know, uh, Paul McCartney or somebody up there. It's amazing. And he's just a prince to work with. And he handles all of the details of the project himself. It's Kristen it's Diabla's amazing. record cost $49,800. We're going to have her distributor here next week. Oh, cool. Did, did you think she paid for that with Kickstarter? <laughs> I you don't know, but you can use if, as long as it's not state funds, we can give you tax credits on it. Yeah. So yeah. All right, we have we have Tim Kappel, entertainment attorney here in town, with a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Philip. Yeah. Um, trying to figure out why these CPAs are charging, you know, or, or offering uh, to provide these services at such a high price point. Yeah. So two questions is one: Is there a publicly available directory of CPAs who uh, provide uh, these certification services? Yes. And two: Is there any sort of state liability that is imposed on these, as someone who's in professional services myself, maybe are they factoring in some sort of risk uh, of, of being wrong on, well, their, on their certification? Or that's a very good question. So. Um, let, me, let me give you the first answer. The answer to that question is yes, we have a list of CPAs uh, that we can provide very easily. Also on the entertain Louisiana Entertainment website, there's a link, and it's, I think, on the, on the main page of the film page for a service that we have called Real Scout. Real Scout is primarily used by people in the film industry to list their services, right? But there is a list of CPAs on our website. You can also email me directly with that. But to answer the second part of your question, this is pure conjecture on my part, but I think one of the... Go ahead and make it up, yes. please. No, this is, uh, this is, I firmly believe this, one of the problems that we have with these with the CPAs charging so much is that risk factor and again and I, I don't mean to be derogatory it's because all of the nonsense that has gone with the film program that a lot of the CPAs are just don't want to be involved with it um, but the bottom line is is that um, from where I sit with my programs if I see something 
that looks funny, I'm just going to, you know, ask questions. And it's not a pass-fail thing. If you send an application or a cost report or an audit and we have questions about it, then we're just going to ask and we're going to work on it and get it right. But my feeling is that they charge so much because of the, the nonsense that, that you see in the press with the film program. That's my theory. John? Well, I had a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, one, is there, for the money that you spend, does it have to be within a, a specific time frame? 12 months, yes. 12 months. Yes. Is that calendar months, fiscal, or just 12 Any months? 12 months, yeah, from start to finish. Yeah. Okay, and are there prereqs? Do you have to file for it before you start spending or anything like that? Yes. Uh, well, so that's a very, very good question. We don't have an advance notice requirement. You can send us the application if you've already started spending money, um, but we can't Is look. Is that new? No. No, I think, well, there may have been an advance notice requirement before I was running the program. Maybe there was, but there is no longer. Uh, however, we won't look back more than six months. So if you send me an application, and if you have been sp already spending money for six months, send the application. Um, but, if, but anything looking back more than six months, we, we can't do. So, so just because if you've already started a project that you think may qualify, or if you have started your project and you haven't gotten around to applying yet, that's okay. There's no application fee. And like I said, you can always call me directly or email me and I can help you through it. Sure, awesome. my pleasure. So, um, well, we talked about how, at, at the beginning of this conversation, how in the legislature there is some interest in giving a haircut to the film program. Uh -huh. Are you hearing the same thing about the sound recording program? No. So you don't think they're looking to decrease the size of the cap from three million to two million or one million? I can't read these guys' minds. I don't think that they really know from day to day what they're planning to is do. Is there to anybody be talking about you. let's just eighty-six this program entirely? Obviously, if we're not reaching the cap, then nobody's using it. So why do we even not need the to program? Me. I mean, I, I would think that probably Reed would know before I would know. You okay. know, but if so, so if but if you're I, is there? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's your answer. All right. So the answer is yes. There is did, uh, from whom? Anybody in the audience have any information on what's going on in the legislature? Oh, oh look, it's Sherry McConnell. That's a very scary thing. Oh, God, I didn't see you come in. Hi. Shoot. <laughs> so, Sherry, I, this yeah. panel's over. You yeah. used to run the, 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 the office that administers all these tax credits, so it has, has a little bit of knowledge here. Hi, Sherry. Yeah. Hi. So, nice what are you hearing in the legislature? So Is some, anybody trying to kill this? As far as the sound recording tax credit, I don't think there's a bill specifically directed at sound recording, but there are blanket bills that do away with all refundability, oh, all rebateability, absolutely, all yes. those things. So certainly sound recording is impacted yeah. by that and it would completely take that there away. Are, there are a number of global bills. Right, right. And so, and, and, in addition, That's there right. are bills that suggest that the application fee would be so prohibitive it wouldn't make sense for anybody to apply yeah, because it would, be, it would exceed the, the, the value of the credit. So. Yeah, in essence, the program is absolutely at risk. So do, do we need to mount a social media campaign to say, hey, legislators, don't kill the one and only tax incentive for the local music industry you've ever created? Well, I, I think that uh, if you want to have an impact on that, that's the way to do it. Clearly, there's not a, a organized lobbying effort for that. And um, at the same time, you do have a, a, a chairman of the Ways and Means Committee who is uh, very much a champion. In fact, uh, authored our legislation in the past when we lowered it to five percent, right. five, five uh, for the threshold, and lowered it to fifteen percent. That was Jeff, Representative Joe Robodeau. But thank you for asking about uh, entirely. We are developing. We have asked Representative Robodeau to introduce a bill, and I'd love for everybody to take note of this. It's House Bill 829. House Write Bill 829. All right, folks. Has Hashtag been, sync up NOLA. Yeah. House Bill 829. Has it, has it been introduced? Is it on the it website? Has. Okay. It's House Bill 829. Uh, we've created a social media campaign that's uh, Louisiana's Big Picture. That's on Facebook. Uh, at Louisiana Big Pick, as far as Twitter. And that bill is a proactive piece of legislation. It's not directed specifically at sound recording. Recording. It's directed at the film incentive bill, a law. And it's basically kind of shifting the debate a little bit and says we need to think about a more sustainable industry. And the belief is that that starts with homegrown filmmaking and homegrown musicians as opposed to Hollywood. So the bill actually incentivizes 
the production of local intellectual property. So it's an enhanced credit if you uh, make a Louisiana screenplay or if it's a screenplay owned by a Louisiana company, and it's an enhanced credit if you place Louisiana copyrighted music. It's a really great bill. It's going to shift the debate. Everything so far is about limiting the cost, but nothing's mm -hmm. talking about the value of the investment of the state. And um, I'd l we very much need everybody's support. So Louisiana's big picture, and uh, at Louisiana big pick if you tweet. Thank you so much. You bet. So wait, I just want to underscore that point. So, so you, the state you come has up? a. Um, <laughs> The state has a, uh, an, an incentive for live music, for, for film production, and for sound recording. Um, so th this bill, House Bill 829, would in add the use of copyrighted songs. So it's an intellectual properties incentive bill. So songwriters, basically, if a movie is coming to Louisiana and shooting, they're already getting tax credits on the production stuff if they hire a Louisiana composer or a Louisiana band and put that music in the movie or in the soundtrack or, or, or the score, then that, whoops, oh Lord. <laughs> Stanton Moore's <laughs> calling. Stanton's calling. He's Is early. Is he running late? He's early. Um, uh, so, so they could, they could so, it's in, so they get an extra points. They get like an additional like 15 percentage points. You got it. So if they're already getting a 30% credit, they would get a 45% credit for what they spend on licensing music. Correct. So, so if it's awesome. a li licensing a, a Louisiana-owned master recording or a licensing a Louisiana-owned composition, they get 15 points extra as a credit for uh, on the part of the, the film producers. Am I getting this more or less correct? You're getting it all correct. Wow. Oh, boy. I studied. You're good. <laughs> you might have Wait, had a little input. I guess I need to read this so, bill. <laughs> so Brent, if you use the microphone, you can. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. So um, given in our experience at Audio Socket, we know a lot of artists don't follow the process of legitimately legally filing for their official copyright with the US Copyright Office. Mm -hmm. For that credit, does it require that you have proof that you have actually filed for your copyright or just evidence that you have created the work in Louisiana? What it is is part of the actual production of the film, so it's an, a qualified production expenditure. And so through the audit that the production company who's making the movie would, would um, submit to the, to the office for ultimately being qualified for tax credits, it would be included as a qualified expenditure, and so it'll be up to the production to in fact verify that and then the auditor to verify that. So when it's submitted to the state, it, those, those things are already taken care of. So the, clearly you guys are gonna need to verify if you've got that copyright, that is in fact you own it. <laughs> and what it does is suggests that it's a Louisiana resident owned copyright, a Louisiana resident company owned copyright and so the definition of Louisiana resident is a little bit more strictly defined. Right now in the law it says you gotta be here six months in the aggregate in one day in, in a year. And of course we're finding problems in the film community that you know we got people flying in and out and they're claiming Louisiana residency and they get an enhanced credit. We're actually redefining Louisiana residents so that they're actually residents and that is that they're a legal resident and they lived, have lived here for a year and for 12 consecutive months. So Louisiana residents are gonna be a little bit tighter, which we think is very helpful for our local employers, employees, and then of course, having Audio Socket as a Louisiana resident owned business, you're all good, man. Feel free. Yeah. And, 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 and Audio Socket, <laughs> but your point is no more poor man's copyright. You have to actually copy, register the copyrights for your songs and if you want to be able to take advantage of this additional credit. And by the way, if you don't register for your copyright initially, and someone violates the copyright, you don't have the statutory damages available to you, yeah. and so you'd rather just be able to sue the original holder of the copyright and get the money back than have to file your copyright. And, so and Audio Socket, if I'm not mistaken, has uh, utilized our, our great digital media incentive program as well. Yeah. 
That's fantastic. He said they moved the tech team from Seattle back home to New Orleans to take advantage of the digital media tax credit. Which is the only We're using tax the microphones credit we for the webcasting. Yeah. That's why I'm repeating what you're saying because I know everybody in here can hear you, but there's millions of people watching online. Of course. <laughs> millions. Millions. Actually, we get about 25 hundred well, that's great. S individual st streams served up uh, each year at sync up for an average viewing time of about 58 minutes so wow. people actually do sit here and watch isn't that right nicole and jimmy <laughs> <laughs> say my name uh, okay great so look we have to wrap this up are there any well you're going to be here for a little while if there are any other questions about any of the uh, tax incentive programs all right john we got to wrap this up make it quick <laughs> what question does the, uh, the cost of the cpa for the audit would that be uh, eligible for the 20%? Yes, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, Philip Mann yes. with Louisiana Entertainment. Yes. Thank you so much for it's, coming it's and sharing all It's my pleasure. Thank you all for knowledge. having me. Thanks. I, I'm going to stick around. I got business cards. Thank you all so much. <laughs>